Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming in person and hi to everybody on Zoom. Hopefully I sound okay and you can hear me. And I do encourage anybody on Zoom just to interrupt me if you have a question. We, we will hear you. So please do it if you if you want to. I see something already in the chat and uh, Allison is going to help me with chat because I really can't read it while giving the talk. But anyway, so uh, again, thank you. Um, I'm Brian and thank you for that great introduction. Um, I, I cover it again uh, if my laptop will work here. <laughs> There we go. Um, yeah, I've been at the Robotics Institute for a while, uh, helping them with their, uh, you know, work over the years and, and, and sharing the great research that they do. Um, and I get to see a lot of really cool ideas in their in their infancy there. And then this this class where uh, students actually visualize complex ideas, and these are these are people who try to figure out how to ex make explainer videos and and how to. Uh, make persuasive arguments and you know that kind of overlaps with uh, pitch videos and these these videos just represent some of the kind of stuff that that that's that 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 happens there i've been teaching filmmaking courses uh you know past life current life and prior life uh proud nyu to school grad um yeah so you're all here for this right i assume so i want you to tell me why you're here particularly anybody who's here in this session i try to tailor it specifically to your specific questions I have a bunch of stuff I can say, but I also am happy to take questions as as we go. Um, that's just to remind me sort of like the, the goal here ultimately for a lot of you. I like to start with what I hope you learn from this instead of ending with this. And I could give you, this is the too long didn't read of this talk. Um, you know, so I think anytime you can construct your pitch into something that resembles a story, it's gonna be a lot more compelling. Um, you make it unique to your vision, your idea, your team. Try to tell it through this idea of, of a story with the beginning, middle, and end. Um, big picture stuff, production value. You should be guiding the viewer's attention. Often that just has to do with controlling what you film. In this age, when I first started giving this talk, it used to be what you do with your iPhone, what you do with a video camera. What do you, now it's like, what do I do with this Zoom call now? Um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And if there's anything I'm forgetting there, let me, let me know. Um, making sure that your audio is good is the biggest takeaway because most people will watch anything if it sounds good. You could have the most beautiful visuals and if I can't really make it out or the audio kind of is a little rough, especially if you have the Zoom cranked up to cancel out barking dog level, noise background noise removal you almost start harming your recording as well we'll talk more about that later be creative with the tools you have this isn't about spending a lot of money it's just about respecting some some basic ideas in terms of creating something with what, what you have access to and i really uh, this is something i want to talk a little bit more about on this year's version of the talk is this idea of visualize as much of as much of your problem your solution your market whatever as you possibly can and that's a that's a big ask but uh we'll talk about it so what is a pitch? You all know what a pitch is better than I do. Um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on the craft a story part of, of your pitch. How do you take all of that kind of stuff that's usually a slide deck and turn it into something that tells a story as opposed to you reading slides for five minutes, right? Um, your video should be less of a talk like I'm giving and more of, uh, of, of an experience for the viewer. That's the goal. So do, uh, wait, I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. So uh, you need to connect with your viewer. This is spelled out right in the, in the McGinnis uh, uh, rules. And I want to emphasize that. You should behave and pretend as if you are pitching directly to real investors in this video or like real investors are watching it. Um, and you should emulate that in-person pitch as much as possible. This comes from the people who watch these videos and their, their influence on the kind of things I talk about here today. They want to see you. They want to meet you. They don't want just disembodied heads. They definitely want you to be in these in some shape or form so that they meet the team. So that's uh, those are the kind of requirements that, that I've read. And I actually will ask Allison also, is there anything else I'm forgetting on this in terms of that? Okay, so that's, a, that's an important detail. They want to be able to meet you and see you. And they're looking to see if you do this. What does this mean? Um, this is this intangible uh, quality, right? 
Is it confident? Is it effective? Is it telling a story? Is it is it making me believe? Is it compelling me? Is it is it persuading me? Uh, there's no magical answer to this question, but you kind of know it when you see it. So I think the biggest thing to focus on is to be confident in that story and in that message. And a lot of this will echo through. But this is right from the, the guide. So where do you start? I recommend you write it down. Don't just do it all off the cuff. Don't just start talking to a Zoom or an iPhone or a camera. Uh, figure out what you're going to say and, and really maybe even play it back to yourself and listen to it. Um, in the class that I teach, I have students read their scripts early as possible to be able to react to what comes across well in, in, the, in the heard form that maybe sounded better on paper. You know, in, you know, it looked better on paper, but it doesn't sound as, as good. So, you know, practice it, read it out loud, get a sense of it, read, write, repeat. This is, a, this is free, you know. Um, I'm gonna show a little template for a, for a script that I think really helps with this. You want to stay precise, you want to use your words efficiently, you want to appeal to the mind and heart of the audience. The, the, this, this rough 150 sort of words per minute is uh, a good pace for the, the timing of your words, but you want to make sure that you leave some breathing room in there too for your audience to absorb and to think. I thought there was a question, but it's not for um, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an existing library of videos that I'm going to refer to a few times throughout this, this video, this company, Wistia. And, you know, it's no surprise they actually help people make videos, but they also want to teach how they make them. And sometimes that can help you do it yourself, DIY, but also it sort of helps a lot of their potential customers understand uh, a lot of the invisible things they do, the complicated things they do. And uh, I think there's a lot there uh, for a small scale team, especially at a place like a uh, university where we have access to a lot of the tools that they do. Um, I just want to give a shout out to them. I am in no way associated with them, I, but I do respect what they do. And I think they did a really good job of sharing a lot of teaching knowledge on their site. And it continues to be there to this, to this day and they keep adding to it. So this is this idea of like visualizing your, your pre-visualizing your idea in your mind. Um, there's many ways to do this. This is just, these are just two of the ways that I think are effective. Really think through what you're showing. This does not have to be a Star Wars storyboard. You know, you can be thinking through how are you going to visualize your problem, your market, so that your entire video isn't just you talking, right? Uh, we'll talk about other ways to create that, that imagery as we go on, but it does help to at least have a dream list anyway. Maybe you have uh, an idea of what you want to show. Maybe there's a lot of question marks in there, but I do really recommend that you try to create this plan. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. Please. Yeah, similar to that. So we went to a lot of hackathons. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to like develop it so it's kind of like you know the really big show kind of deal and then really piss off? Yes. Yeah. We're I'm a big fan of that show right now. Yeah. Been watching the JBO. Been watching the Junior Bake Off with, yeah. with my son who's here. But but so elaborate on your question. What do you what do you mean? Like it's just gonna be like, like in a sense of how they how they shoot for that kind of production style. Yeah, or make it look like that. It's, we're doing the hackathon for the student, I'm the junior mentor, and then right. also to help um, get more money. You probably heard more of the Airbnb first. Oh yes, that's big news. Yeah, no, I uh, like if I'm understanding your question right, it's just sort of like okay. If we wanted to capture what they do, like yeah. so, so I know a little bit about how they produce that because they've shared that on their website and they've talked about it a little bit. But you know, in that room, there's a lot more happening that you don't see. So there's there's a microphone on every kid. There's a microphone on either side of every table. Oh, exactly. There's a there's there's two or sometimes three roving teams of a camera person, sound person, and producer who are scrambling around in groups of three. They're they're almost tied together like with umbilical cords, capturing as much as they can. Um, a lot of that stuff is either being time coded in a way so that all the tapes, or digital tapes, all have the same time code. So when they go to edit it, they have an enormous amount of material, but they at least see it all in sync. And they bring it into a system where they might see the, the source of four, five, six, depending on how complicated the day was or how important the day was. I think early in the show, they have even more because there's more people there, right? And then they see all of that. But stylistically, I think you could build on it. You would, you would just have to structure the way when people are doing things uh, and you would have to give people guidance. Like, okay, you, Brian, you run around with your iPhone, make sure you're filming it sideways. 
and your job is to just get people's like reactions to things. You other person with your iPhone, it's your job to ask them questions. And maybe you have two good quality sources that covers a bunch of it. Maybe not as much as Great yeah. British Show, but, and then the real magic is when the sun is setting and the light is beautiful outside, you take them out under a tree and you ask them some questions and that always looks beautiful because they do that at magic hour, five, six, 7 p.m., whatever it is in, in, in that season when they're, when they're filming. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so like a lot of it is just like timing and, and clever clever use of the of the, uh, of the the space, you know? Use the tent. It's not, it's not in a room, it's filmed in the tent. Right, the tent. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and that actually, they use that as a lighting source uh, because if the weather's cooperating, there's a diffused soft light that they naturally just get everywhere. And I don't know if that's why they do it in the tent, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a big reason why they why they do. Because lighting, something we're gonna talk about later, it's nice to it's nice to make sure that you look half decent in your video, you know. Yes. Is it any different how you count your speed of words per minute? Because usually when we are teaching, we usually don't have it in this form, usually right. we have a pitch deck. And under that in the comments, that's where you write the script. And maybe you have a timestamp, but it's not really helping you to have it words per minute. It is a really challenging thing. You, you, this 150 words per minute pace, and you know, it's just a, it's just a ballpark. I have been able to listen to and absorb information from 300 words per minute, no problem. It's just that, like, sometimes it just helps to, to start figuring out what your pace is for a video, and 150 happens to be a sweet spot. I wouldn't be surprised. I am not speaking 150 words right now. I'm speaking probably 250 per minute. Like, so just to give you, like, like a sense of that, because I'm trying to get through a lot in one hour. But um, the only way, only real thing I can say is you, you, yeah, you, you practice it, and then you, you say, okay, am I coming in under five minutes on this? Um, and then I have students that will write a script that just fills the five minutes, and they didn't even take a breath. You know, they're just flying from next idea to next idea, and sometimes that's great for, but then sometimes you feel like they hurried through something, and it's like, no, show that for five seconds, let that really sink in, and then go on to the next thing. You know, so 100, 150 is a guideline, not a rule. Okay, but. Um, let's move on here. So I usually talk about how filmmaking, and this is like a crash course in filmmaking ideas. And filmmaking, filmmaking will outlast everything. And I even use the word filmmaking knowing that we most of the time are not even going to use film anymore in the future. But the, the idea of visual storytelling goes back to pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. Pretty bland terms, like planning basically the part where you actually shoot, which may be in the case of a show like the, the British show, may just be one whole Saturday. And then an enormous amount of time spent editing, it, right? Um, so you have to make time for these phases, but they're just gonna look a little bit different for you. The biggest place where you save the most time is the first two, where you're just really nailing down what you want. Um, this is probably the quickest, but yet most important, because obviously if you don't gather the media, then there's nothing. And then you need some amount of time to edit. But if you shot it in a way where you where you uh, have a plan, usually the editing can go quickly. Uh, again, in the case of the reality show, they're at the mercy of what, what they get. They, they have a general plan, but they don't know everything they're gonna get. This is not new stuff. This stuff's been around, like I said, a hundred years. It's even been written in books for kids. I wanna give a shout out to this, this book from a few years back. I was at a Barnes and Noble years ago and I saw this laying on the shelf. And I was like, oh yeah, this is it. This, they teach this to, to, to 10 year olds and they teach this to 50 year olds. It's the same idea. Get a script, plan, shoot it, make sure your lighting and sound is not bad, edit it. <laughs> you know, and this is the, this book actually could almost double for a majority of what I'm, what I hope to present here today. But it's again, uh, just a, just, it's just a nice thing to, it's a humbling thing to see what you teach and what you do being taught to 10 year olds and realize, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> So how are you gonna visualize your idea? This is the biggest problem you have that I don't have magical answers for. You do want to figure out, a, maybe it's a metaphor, maybe it is in the form of existing video and graphics that you can augment. Um, are you, uh, you know, obviously you're gonna be in it. So you have to figure out, well, how am I gathering the video myself? Is that with my laptop? Is that with a camera that I borrow from a, from a place here on campus? Maybe you use an iPhone that's on a tripod. Those are all fine options. But the other stuff in there, 
uh, you know, do you have sketches and drawings and maybe putting in scans of your drawings? Like, don't think of still images as bad. You know, those those could all make for compelling pieces in a video. Um, there's stock footage that might help uh, visualize your, the environment. I did a, you'll see later on, like, I, I was like, well, you know, the, the idea of a factory. Like, if I needed a good video of a factory, but I don't have the time to go and shoot my own B-roll of the factory, what exists? And, and we've come a long way just in a number of years. I'm amazed at the resources online that are free for that. And I don't mean going to YouTube. I mean going to like a free stock photo website where it's like, here, download this clip and give credit to this person. They're willing to give it to you. And let me show you that now. Um, make sure I'm not missing anything here. Where will the viewers, where will the viewers see the person speaking and where will they see supporting imagery? So this is a good point. Like if you do want to film somebody outside or if you want to film them in the environment that's relative to your to your topic, that's more challenging, but that may be very compelling. Obviously, the more controlled your environment is, the better. If you have a room with carpet and, uh, and the lighting is naturally nice and and it's and it's just a close-up of you, then it's more about making sure the sound sounds good than it is about the environment. But anybody have a question on that? Because that's that is unique to your ideas and everyone's pitches are. Wide range of it. Can anyone just throw out one of like their their pitch ideas so I get a sense of like one or two of them? Like what's your what's your or is this the wrong environment for that? <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it helps me tailor some of the things I'm going to talk about later on here. Like what's your target audience or your target main like the 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 heart of your your idea, I guess. Like how to survive the night. Okay, that's yes. So that's that's good. That helps me. Anybody else with something to contrast that with? Yeah, okay, okay. So are many of you still visualizing or dreaming? Up, please. Yeah, I guess asking. Tell me in person. Okay, there you go. So we're all. That's a. I'm, they're right there. That's diverse. Like we're all over the map here. So it really depends on where, like putting your people in an environment can sometimes be nice and sometimes it can be really challenging if the environment doesn't really support the good sound aspect of this. Other ways you can visualize, and these are resources that exist online, uh, they're free. There's this thing called the Noun Project. There's a website called VecEasy. Um, and there's this other website called Pexel, which offers free, <laughs> Clips. So it's the kind of stuff that really a lot of business pitches might be able to leverage. And this is a search for the word factory on all three of them. And I am amazed by how much is there. And a lot of them, they are absolutely free. And they just ask that you please credit the creator of that of that piece. And you could just put that at the title or the the, uh, the end credit slide on your on your video. And you've made everybody happy. Free music too. Um, there's there's the free music archive. I did not put that up here, but I want to mention them too while I'm here. Um, so this might help jumpstart some things. And so to, to, just to give some context, sometimes it's neat to superimpose things over videos in the class that I teach. And sometimes it's interesting to take an existing graphic and augment it so that it does something that the student wants it to do. In other words, like add smoke stacks or, or wipe this and turn it into a green factory or any number of things you might do. And this accelerates some of that visualization with, and they're not art students. They're not, they are taught how to make things in Photoshop and Illustrator, but they're not at the level where they can just like whip this up in Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, you know, you know, flat. Although I am fortunate to sometimes have some people who are more skilled in Illustrator, for example, and, and do some, some nice things. But I don't fault anybody for leveraging existing imagery in a way that helps tell your story. And you should do that if you can. Let's talk more about film language. This is particularly true if you plan to dramatize. I don't know realistically how much time there is in a five minute pitch to do this, but if you were to show some representation of your target doing the, the uh, you know, the, the target user experiencing or doing uh, what you plan to pitch, um, this is more relevant if you're trying to sort of dramatize and literally you know, cast a character that represents somebody in your in your pitch. Um, and, and this is like filmmaking. This is this is where it's about controlling your camera. It means put it on a tripod. It means get the microphone as close to whoever is speaking as reasonably possible. Um, I, I, I. This this used to mean outside of the frame of the camera. And now we live in this age where 
podcasters are very proud to have the biggest microphone that they mm -hmm. purchased in the shop with them. So times change. It used to be a time when you didn't want to see the microphone. That broke the illusion. That broke the reality of it. And now it's like, I have a lot of authority. I have a gigantic microphone in the shop. And they're like speaking right into it. And again, that's because like Howard Stern and stuff was hosting a radio show where they want to sound amazing. And they happen to start filming. Um, so if you're truly a podcast where you just hear it and you don't see it, then that makes more sense. But I think now you have a lot of video creators who are proud to show you their microphone. And at the end of the day, if you're if they're teaching you something or, or helping you with something, you don't care about that microphone. But if you're trying to dramatize the situation, you don't want to see them. Uh, be mindful of natural light that you can take advantage of, or for that matter, just simply not putting a window behind you, ruining your shot. And we'll talk more about audio and focus as we go on, but critical. You know, uh, thankfully the technology saves us here a lot now. This used to be a big deal. I don't even think an iPhone would let you shoot video out of focus. So that's amazing. There used to be a time when that was one of the biggest problems that student filmmakers have is keeping their stuff in focus. And now we don't really even worry about that anymore. But I would say the thing you do need to worry about is where you put your camera and how much of your subject you show. And try to remember that you have variety here. You have you have control over how much you show and when. And this is just a film school, like I said, crash course, where are you setting more of the scene than the environment in what's called a, a long shot or an extreme long shot? Are you giving us more of a sense of the subject and what they're doing, a medium shot? Most shots and things are medium shots, but if your entire video is medium shots, that can get boring. Sometimes it's important to use close-ups for details that matter and are relevant. For example, establishing the scene, a part where he's reading, in a part where he sees and notices something. That shot says something to the viewer. If all of those things were medium shots, again, you have my other faux pas that I that become accepted. Everything on YouTube is a jump cut. They just have the same shot, chop out all the crap, hook it all together. Again, when someone's just teaching me something, I don't care. In fact, I'm thankful. They saved me a lot of time. But if I'm trying to dramatize something, you don't want to keep seeing the same shot over and over again. Uh, to follow that up, you usually be mindful of an imaginary line through your space. For example, if in your pitch, there's two people having a conversation or something takes place in the Starbucks and that's somehow relevant, you know, just any, any situation where there's two people talking to each other, the general rule of thumb is if you keep the cameras all on one side of that action, no matter how you edit it, your audience will never be confused because no matter where I position these cameras in space, this person will always be on that side of the image and vice versa. This is a very simple rule that's easy to break, but it's just nice to call it out to people who maybe haven't heard it before. And again, this is like Film School 101. Um, and it is uh, it is a rule that is broken sometimes on purpose to create confusion in your audience and dramatic tension. And when cameras move around people, that's when you just start playing with that. But in a pitch video, you just want to make sure that if you establish user and you establish tech, and you want that relationship to maintain consistent, just be mindful of this basic rule. I like it when the people pitching talk right to the camera. That's a personal preference of mine. Uh, when I work with researchers who are pitching their robotic idea and they want to then show the demo, I like it when the researcher talks straight to me. This is because we're not trying to create this illusion of, a, of an alternate reality. It's okay that the researcher is speaking right to the camera. But in a movie, when they do it, it's funny, right? It's weird. That's called this fourth wall idea. So again, if you're being interviewed and you want to portray an interviewer prompting one, somebody on your team with a question, sometimes the person actually is not looking at the camera. They're looking more at the interviewer and you establish that consistency. Sometimes you have the interviewer stand right behind the camera or sometimes it's just you all by yourself talking to a camera in the room, trying not to go crazy. So be mindful of that idea. Um, if, if some of your team is looking off camera and some of you talk right to the camera, it's not the end of the world, but just be mindful of it. It might edit together weird and might make some people feel different in the video than, than others. So just be mindful of this. Any questions on this? That's pretty straightforward, but it's, a, it's an important detail. Be mindful of your composition. That's all this slide really means. You know, there's this there's this bizarre idea. I wonder if it's even real called the rule of thirds. And basically, it's a hint at good composition. We have it in our cameras. It says turn on the grid view or turn on the, the grid. Um, the theory is that if you just 
be mindful of these points of intersection in terms of how you compose your frame. It makes for a more compelling frame. This frame also implies that there's someone she's speaking to that's on this side of the screen world because she's leaning this way in the, in the frame. Same idea here. Um, but then rule of thirds is harder to really parse when you see something like this, but it does indeed line up the car that this, this is what you're supposed to look at. There's the dynamic part of the of the, the rule being used there. Um, do I think about the rule of thirds when I'm composing things? No. <laughs> I, I'm i glad I was taught this rule, but I I think you just start to do this more new, intuitively and naturally. And actually, I think people have gotten better and better at composing things just because of, uh, you know, the practice we have. We're in a more media savvy world. I wanted to just call out some examples of that because it's kind of cool. Oops. Uh, how do I click on it if it is over here? I can't. All right. I'll skip it for now, but maybe I'll come back to this at the end. There's a great video on Vimeo. I saw your mouse flash did it? Did it? Like I have to go over here to click it? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's my son, Henry. <laughs> he, he's off for election day today, and uh, and he's with me today. But I do know one thing. This shot is boring. Just like in the game of tic tac toe, the center square is not always your best move. Next up, we'll spend a quick minute talking about framing and shot cop. Literally a minute. Video yeah. They visualize this so well. That's why I like showing this little clip. Okay, so the center square is boring. But how should you frame a basic headshot? Well, here is nice, or here. It's also legal in 37 states in Puerto Rico to cut off the top of a man's head, but don't cut off their chin. Square television frame composition differs fits in widescreen TV and even wider movie screens. And of course, the background is usually important. For example, horizons that cut a screen in half were born. Most camcorders have a guide frame overlay that you can toggle on to help with basic composition. And we have that on our phone so too. Taking it to the next level might mean going to the bookstore and browsing through the art photography and painting section. Even easier, watch some TV or movie, and instead of just bending out, pay attention to the composition and frame. Videography is a unique and amazing 3D art form, flattened onto a two dimensional screen and then expanded into the fourth dimension of time and motion. Well, you can learn the basics in a minute. It definitely takes a lifetime to master it. Whatever you call it, tic tac toe, guide frame, rule of thirds, just keep it interesting. Remember, you can't break the rules if you don't know what they are. Right. And I would argue that although that seems very focused on, on um, film narratives, it's, it's very relevant to all video. And like you could even take that into account with how you compose yourself in your Zoom frame or, or video calls of the future, whoever takes over Zoom someday um help me find keynote where are you i'm not used to this too just to this uh this system right here do you see it i found it but it's over here ah okay it's over here and then when i hit play it goes back over here great um there's another great video on this so these slides will be posted with the same ideas uh, that, that you see there in that more, I want to I want to emphasize the rule of thirds, but it is, it's like you said, you have to know the rules before you break them. And Wes Anderson is somebody who's famous for using a lot of centered and symmetrical composition for artistic choice. So just be mindful of, be mindful of this. Well, let's talk about audio. I think this is one of the most important things to hammer. And I think I can't say it enough and I'll say it three times. People will watch a video with good audio, even if the video is not that good, but they will not watch a video that's perfect with bad audio. It's just the audio wins. And what do you do here? You know, I like to lean on this idea that we happen to all usually have one of these. And I want to talk, take you through a scenario. Like let's say I was filming somebody outside 
and uh, and I'm far away from them to show the environment. I probably have a wireless mic hidden on their body somewhere. And that's something that you can borrow from, from, from Hunt or whatever. But a more realistic scenario is a Zoom call. You, you're on Zoom, you're using it as a video recorder. You may or may not get good, good or acceptable audio back depending on your settings. Particularly if you're the person who's saying, okay, team member A or team member B, I need you to go on Zoom and do these slides or I need you to do this part. A real handy trick that I'd recommend that you do is tell them, go ahead and open up your phone, open up the voice recorder that's on your phone, voice recorder on Android or uh, voice memos on iOS. Put it on your desk, hit record, do the Zoom or, or whatever camera they're using and have them send you both. Have them send you the audio from the phone that was recorded separately. You can actually put those two things together and make a Zoom call sound really, really good. And it doesn't hurt if you tell them, try not to be in the room in your house that has the most wooden floors and the least carpeting. Um, we've gotten really good at this during the pandemic. Early in the pandemic, you go back and watch uh, some people who were on Zoom. Um, some of them knew what they were doing and many people didn't. So be mindful of that frame. The Zoom, the Zoom, the people on Zoom who are like literally like at the bottom of their frame, running games who always make me laugh, um, and the people who are obviously in a room of barking dogs and they have the voice. So if you are recording it for the purposes of making a pitch video, go into audio settings and say suppress background noise, turn that off. And there's even another setting in there for the really ambitious. It's called record professional audio, and it will not even compress it at all. And then you might not need to do the phone thing. Um, just so you know, that's that, but that um, I have mixed results with both because now you're at the mercy of the microphone and your laptop. And ironically, even though your laptop costs a lot more than a lot more than your phone, the microphone in your phone is far superior. And uh, you get a much better result. And you have different kind of you're recording it with an app that's not trying to do any of the uh, on the fly uh, filtering. Basic basic idea that's easy to forget. Again, I used to teach, hey, students, make sure your audio is not too loud. It will sound bad. Make sure it's not too quiet. It won't be able to hear it at all. Make sure that you are getting the, the level of your audio recorder is set so that you're somewhere in this sweet zone. No one does this anymore. Um, the, I don't even know where the gain setting is on here. It's so at the mercy of the automatic gain on a lot of devices now, and the tech on that has become so good, this is almost not a problem like it used to be. But if you are working with any device that allows you to set the gain, be mindful of too much gain, clips your audio into little, really shoots it in the foot. Like you just wanna to try to make sure you're recording a good level with it. Um, this is a demonstration of that thing I was just saying. I think we shot something in a class uh, where the, 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 the audio on the camera is, is in this first clip. And there's a little tiny microscopic, horrible microphone built into many really nice SLR cameras, but it's a really crappy microphone because it's designed to make a good video. This was shot with probably a, just a basic DL, uh, DSLR that you can borrow again from the Hunt library. Andrew ID is all you need. You get it for a day or, a day or so, and you probably can take it off for more than that. Uh, let me see if this video plays. I think I have to come over here though, yeah, and then click on it. This is the camera audio. Now I can take it into a little thing and turn it up and maybe the video editor will save me. That exists. But it's so much nicer when I just have a separate audio recording recorder, either off frame, sitting in front of her, or it's a phone. There's this these, these funky recorders that you can check out that are even uh, uh, they're even cooler than a phone because they're like directional and then you save out the wave file. And you, you know, it's it's even better. But I will say you could probably get a similar result with an iPhone 10 or better. Um, this, and then we'll hear the difference here. So we are learning to use tripods and different filming equipment to take interviews. Uh, we're practicing using uh, an SD recorder, I think it's called, uh, to record audio. It's that uh, thing. For example, the dual system uh, way of capturing video and audio through separate devices and uh, syncing them at the end. Right, and there's a really cool thing. Like you can just visually look at the bad audio and the good audio and line it up, and you can actually do that very quickly if you just 
have some basic skill, but now the tools are even better than that. You can say, hey, Premiere, hey, whatever video editor. There's many of them. I can't even begin to like pretend that I know all of them. I can think of four off the top of my head and two others that are mildly used and some are more pro and some are even more basic that some of those just standard tools that you can get access to in the CMU lab like Premiere Pro, you tell it, here's my video, it has bad audio, here's the audio file that's good. It'll even go through and just find the synchronization of the stuff for you. Even if they're not the same length, it'll find where it starts, the keyword, and it will synchronize it for you. So again, that used to be something where I would even do a demo on that. And I, I think conceptually you get it. I have a video that if I have time, I'll show it at the end. I'll, I'll show a little clip of it, but it's, just something to keep in mind. That's called a dual system when you actually record good audio in one place and good picture in one place and just plan on putting them together at the end. This is great for Zoom though, because Zoom historically has pretty bad audio come out of it when you when you record it. More on smartphones. So I apologize. I'm talking a lot about the iPhone because I'm biased and I have one and there's a lot of stuff there, but these things do exist in the Android world too. Um, back to my friends at Wistia here. Uh, let me show you a few of uh, a few of their things here. And this is this is this is a lot of eye-opening parts in here that echo what I've already said and touch on some new things. So they've been talking about this for years, um, and it's kind of cool to see the history of the iPhone in this too because they've made new ones since. But I do think this is great to see. The, they're talking about doing good stuff on an iPhone eight, and now we're on iPhone fourteen. So just just check this out. This is this. There's we may not watch all of this, but we will watch a, a chunk of it here. You can make an amazing video for your business using nothing but your phone. And Ruben, we're shooting this entire video using the default camera app on an iPhone. This is the setup. I should pause there and let you see, but that's the just the, the, the three-person crew. Your video shine. Start by setting up your shot. Even with the iPhone's image stabilization, handheld footage looks less professional. So grab a tripod and a phone mount. There are a bunch of mounts to choose from and a bunch of different tripods you can use. If you need to move around while you're shooting, consider investing in a gimbal for your phone. Your footage is going to be you can, buttery smooth. You can borrow one for free. If you here. can, pick a location with lots of natural and diffused light. The less light there is, the more likely you're going to get an image that looks muddy and, well, bad. So if you can, choose your location with that in mind. If you need more light during the day, try to go with white lights to match day. Frame up your shot using the good old-fashioned rear camera lens. Yep, even if you're filming yourself. Selfie camera looks decent, but just isn't as good as a rear camera. Here's the selfie camera, and here's the rear camera. More, and more pixels. If you want to get closer to your subject, move the phone closer instead of pinching in the zoom. You're going to get a way sharper image by actually moving the camera close to what you're filming. If your phone has multiple lenses, super wide or telephoto lenses will come in handy too. But keep in mind that if you're shooting in lower light situations, the standard one act lens is going to perform the best. If you're unsure of how to compose a nice looking shot, use your phone's built in grid and frame it using the rule of thirds. Go to settings, camera, and toggle grid to on. Now line up your subjects so they fall neatly on an intersecting. Kind of weird with the TV grid naturally here. Spaces, make sure your subject's eyes intersect with the top line. And while you're in here, go ahead and turn off HDR mode for video. It doesn't look very good. That's a good thing I would forget. Here's something for all of you Apple Watch wearers out there. Is it wearers? You can actually use your watch as a little preview window to help you frame up your shot. It's super handy if you're shooting by yourself. No Apple Watch, no problem. Airplay your phone to your MacBook and use that as a preview button. Lock in exposure to avoid lighting changes that happen halfway through your shot. Tap and hold the focus and exposure box to lock in your settings. And then drag the sun slider up or down to expose the shot. There's also a neat exposure dial if you want to lock in exposure but not focus. Tap the carrot, exposure icon, and slide left and right. Good sound matters way more than you think. <clears throat> Let's try that. Good sound matters more than you think. For this video, so I made that point five times already. <laughs> using a second iPhone hanging from a broomstick. So to get good sounding audio, borrow another iPhone, record a voice memo, and place the phone right above your subject, just out of the shot, or even upside down in a shirt pocket. Now it's time to get creative. The iPhone has some handy shooting modes to help your video stand out. 
Cinematic mode mimics the look of high-end movie cameras by separating your subject with a subtle blur. Try using it on hero shots like this. Slow motion can be used to make even the dullest moments look epic. And time-lapse mode can illustrate how something comes together over an extended period of time. To get the highest quality video footage, do not text or email your videos to your computer. Instead, plug your phone in and use image capture or airdrop all of your video footage to your computer. If those options don't work, upload your videos to Dropbox, Google Drive, or even Wistia, and then download them on your computer in full quality. That's it. Right. So, so they cover a lot of things in their library, and I'm a big fan of these folks. They're really good at teaching, and they're really good at what they do. Um, the the couple of the things they sort of just show without saying, like this this hero shot, for example. I just thought it would be a nice thing to call out that be mindful of camera angles. If you want you and your team to appear confident and big and large and strong, you shoot from a lower angle. If you want to make your competition appear weak and small and diminished, you shoot from a higher angle. Just stuff like that that uh, is easy to, to, to be not as mindful of depending on the situation. And here we go. Anyway, any questions on that? Please. Please. Like you handheld, like people around, and it's for all because I just met somebody who like has one for only hundred twenty dollars, yep. and it works well. And this person is using iPhone to record recordings, which already has stable Yeah. Oh, yes. I was shocked. This is happening like with iPhone and hundred dollars. I've seen a Twitch streamer around town too who had a, a more new iPhone on one of those. And I have seen stuff being being made for TV with it too. That's how far the iPhones come. Like this was like revolutionary. Like, oh, the business people can make videos with it just with their iPhone Seven. Now you got TV production. Like just taking advantage of just how lightweight it is. It has built-in stabilization. The gimbal is a lot of these things used to cost thousands of dollars, and now they cost very little, or you can borrow them. Do we even need, or do you recommend like external microphones or some external stuff in addition to phone? If you are close to your subject with the iPhone, like within five feet, the microphones are pretty okay. But yes, I think that that point is what they're saying there. Like as soon as you, if you have an environment where you can put a microphone near your near your subject, and what's annoying is there are ways to attach external microphones to iPhones, but most people don't do it. Like it's what's old is new again. But back when they made movies before video cameras and then digital, you had a camera and you had the sound system. And then it was the person who displayed it. Yeah. And that was the magic to put the two together. Yeah. Video, okay, maybe we'll tether. And maybe for Great British, they just go ahead and tether the sound person straight to the camera to save themselves. I'm sure that still happens a lot. But this dual system thing is like the way a lot of things are being done now because it's just so convenient. Like, they can just get what they need, and the synchronization that used to be a little bit tedious or a little bit annoying is now it's not even a problem. So my, my answer to, to you is yes, just whatever it takes to get a, an additional recorder or microphone close to your subject. Because like if I'm filming you from this far away and you're talking to my camera and my shot looks great, even this is your audience is not. But the iPhone will try. There's tech in there that's trying to make you sound as good as it can, but it's not going to sound as good if I just sat a mic right there on your laptop. <laughs> So maybe microphone and external light are the two things you Yes, and I highly recommend just taking advantage of natural light. You come into a space where there's a lot of nice ambient light, soft light. Um, I don't think anyone's going to go out and like rent and buy light kits for this kind of pitch video, but it's nice. We'll talk more about lighting in a minute, but I will say, make sure you shoot everything horizontally, unless you're making an app or a TikTok, because I'm still in the camp where most videos need to be horizontal, but... Uh, that may change. I may be giving this talk five years from now. I'm like, now all videos are shot this way. So I don't know this TVs are still this shape. <laughs> so be mindful of that. Because a lot of times the team will be like, hey, it's me. And then now you have to do like some clever thing where you like it all depends on what you design. If all of your team do it this way, and you want to put team member one here, team member two here, team member three here, and and that's a design choice at that point. That's not. That's not uh, that's not following my rule. You still made 
a video that is a rectangle, you just use the space creatively. So your source was shot vertically. So I'll clarify that. But let's talk about lighting. You bring up lighting. So for a while, I taught this uh, lighting class where uh, these were these were the key takeaways after 14 weeks of practice. Um, and I will save you 14 weeks. But what you get out of that 14 weeks is some, you actually get to uh, work with these kinds of lights uh, hands on. And the one that I think most people want to make themselves look uh, as pleasant as possible and don't have shadows on their face is this, this, this strange concept of soft light. All that means is the light is not very directional. When light takes on a, a, a straight direction, it casts very straight shadows. And basically this side of the scale is like comedy news pitch videos. And this side is Mad Men. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other like what with the, the Stranger Things and other and other and other dark high contrast drama as opposed to soft, bright comedy slash happy, <laughs> dare I say happy pitch videos, right? So you can take advantage of this when you when you pose your problem. Maybe you don't worry about shadows, but when you present your solution, it's all soft and bright and beautiful. Um, you know, that sounds hokey, but watch commercials now with that in mind. <laughs> They're doing it all the time. Um, so um, this, this all boils down to high key. And this is this other vague term that just basically means everything on this side of the scale is called high key. Everything on that side of the scale is called low key. And the key is usually your, your main light and what your main light is doing. Some, some examples of contrast ratio. Uh, no, no, no contrast at all. Very frontal lighting, very, very boring, but often actually it's a picture video where you're not trying to dramatize something, you're just trying to focus on the person and see them dreaming. Sometimes a little bit of contrast is nice, but you notice that the drama is immediately apparent. Of course, this facial expression is not helping. More contrast, the more terrifying they are. So you, this is, I should have probably flipped these images because uh, that side was, was low key and this side was high key and I, I flipped it on you, but th this, this direction is high key in these cases. And it's more obvious in black and white, not as obvious in, in color, but, but it is. Very high key outdoor, using this image again, um, maybe bouncing some light onto the subject, low key, harsh shadows, highlights, drama can be used for comedy or drama. It's just usually some kind of uh, intention there. I don't think anybody is gonna do this nowadays. This is how this used to be done. You would borrow a light kit. This would be the fill light that was creating a soft kind of light coming out of this box. There's a light right here. It bounces around in here and comes out in many directions. This light is close to the subject, is the key, and it's providing most of the light you see on that side of the subject, and there's a little bit of softness being added to it on the front. This light is shining on the back of their head, that's called the backlight, and that's helping separate them from the background, and this light is shining on the wall. And that's helping to create a multi-layered dimensional image there that helps separate the, the subject from the background. I don't think anybody's doing this for a pitch video, but I want to do it show this image because this is more what's going on when you see high-end production value stuff. And don't feel bad if your thing can't quite pull off what they're doing with four lights and a controlled environment. Um, I think to go back to the British show, it's a great, great example. The right time of day and often just using your environment creatively. For example, if light is coming in and it bounces off of a white table or a white wall, and I'm talking about outside or inside, and that light bounces back onto your subject in a pleasant way. You now have a soft light. Um, take advantage of your environment if, if possible. I like to put this in to make, make your, you know, just, just call attention to how things change. Now, when you have people, Twitch streamers online, more people who are salespeople who want to have a really slick Zoom setup. You know, they're not they're not using this mic in the laptop or uh, this this camera in the laptop, they're using this one and it's tied into the, to the laptop. You have to buy an adapter. 
And notice how they're not showing you the cables because that would ruin the photo entirely. Because there's a cable coming out of here, a cable coming out of here. But anyway, a light to bake in position for fill light, soft light. This is just one of many products. Again, I showed it in the call outfit. There was the the way you might do it for, for news uh, is, or on a student level of what news tries to do. You see the 60 minute setup, they're even more elaborate than the one I showed, but you can get something pretty impressive out of a out of a flat, flat light or a ring light. A lot of people buy the ring light. Uh, and I think this question came up like how are you going to stabilize your camera? Tripods are great. There's something you could you could have tabletop ones. You could have this, this little springy thing here. Um, the the idea of a gimbal is uh, totally great, but you're not always necessarily tracking somebody through space. That's good if you are doing that. If you are not tracking someone through space and you're simply just holding it, I feel like the stabilization of the camera is good enough to handle that. Keep the camera close to yourself and just use your own self and your own body as your stabilizer. I think there's some stuff in here. I don't know if it's um, particularly useful or not, but uh, there was a great New York Times article on this and I thought a screenshot of this was actually pretty effective. They show some, some other kits and some other tripods. Um, this was from last year and probably still relevant. They had some really good recommendations here on phone stabilization and phones are being used more and more for professional production. Tripod that's like the gorilla that is that's flexible as opposed to the fixed one. Only if I'm going to a weird environment. If I'm going to again, it so depends on where you're going. If you're going somewhere where you're you can't depend on having a floor or a table, then it comes in great. But if you have a floor or a table, it's not worth it. your trouble in my opinion because it's a little goofy. Um, you definitely have to have it up high. I like if I'm just interviewing people in front of my camera, I I put a tripod and the camera is up at. I also think when you interview people on camera, they're more comfortable when they're standing. And I do think that if they sit, they take on a different kind of stature and a different a different way about them. So just as my personal preference, I would encourage them to stand and project and speak to the camera at standing, um, in which case it's nice to have the tripod on top. Because if you have one of those little GoPro ones and it's sitting on a table and you're looking out and the angle looks good, good. but if it's too low, it can't look good. I already kind of covered this. Uh, I did want to bring up this link, though. Uh, I, I Googled this last night. Um, Scripps Research goes, goes through this in great detail. Uh, if you indeed are using Zoom to do a, some of your image capture, they do a great job of, of showing good and bad, and they step through why this is bad. This backlit Zoom is, you know, low angle, looking up his nose. I see a ceiling fan. I love how he's still smiling in it, though. Um, Pretty straightforward stuff that I think is easy to take for granted. Like you, you kind of know it when you see it, and this tries to demystify what it is, making you look good and making you sound good. And he, I think they do go into if you're doing this for TV, they tell you what settings to go to to, to help it not just be compressed for a Zoom call, but actually because you're trying to use it as a production tool. Um, maybe there's even more on this that I know uh, because I, I, I'm fortunate to have other tools that I use. I don't rely on Zoom much, but I just I know a lot of you maybe. Um, yeah, so just something to call out. And, and then, like I said, these, this, these slides and links will be available, um, outside of this talk. So you have to put it all together. How many of you have ever touched a video editor tool? Uh, I'm moving. Any of you ever touched Premiere Pro? Final Cut, Final Cut Pro. Um, they're not the only ones, but they're the most famous ones. One time ago when doing dancing videos and having sound from microphone and video from the other thing. And Do you remember what that tool was? I don't Could have been, Premiere is very popular and one that I know is here on campus at, at your disposal. Um, Final Cut is probably also, and those are those are intimidating tools. I am used to using Final Cut after years of, of using it, and I'm comfortable and creative with it. There's another tool that I'm a big fan of that actually only costs $99. Again, I'm in no way paid by this company, but they are called ScreenFlow, and I do want to give them a shout out. It's called ScreenFlow. I don't think I have a slide in here that represents them, but they are actually a great way to screen capture your work, capture yourself, 
not for Zoom, but for the sake of presenting. And then it actually doubles as a very functional video editor. So if any of you don't want to use the lab and you want to buy a tool, that's just one of a few. iMovie is also great um, for, for a very low cost example. But I would just, I would recommend that you stick to cutting. Don't go too crazy with the transitions. You're doing your best to remove and avoid distractions, not create them, okay? So I always love to show this slide. Homer's really into the star white transition in the, on the Simpsons. And uh, I, I hope all of you have the restraint to, to know that maybe that's taking it too far, especially after he uses it for the fifth time. Turn down your music. If you do use music, don't drown out what you want me to hear. Don't be surprised if you have to turn down your music 50, 60, maybe even 70% so that I hear the voice correctly. Sure, the music can be a little louder at the beginning, but as soon as people start talking, know how to turn them down. And there is, sometimes you are controlling the sound volume using almost like an intuitive set of points that is an up and down sort of wire that you're sort of moving up and down. Sometimes you set uh, a point of, of quiet and loud. I'm generalizing because there's five or six different tools out there and they all do it slightly differently. But the one I'm more familiar with is this idea of a, there's almost like a straight line that represents normal volume and you move that line up and down and you also can uh, adjust what that line looks like. Screen flow, I do mention them here. So that's how you spell it. If you're, if you're interested in looking them up, I use them for a lot of things and they're really cool. They're a great video editor, but they're also great at, at just capturing work, especially if you're trying to demonstrate code or demonstrate other work you've done that is on a computer. They're also, it's also great for creating teaching content and I use it for that a lot. Now you have to, up, you have to output the thing. Thankfully, this is much less confusing than it used to be. You just usually say, export me a 1080p file using H.264. And there's usually some generic setting that just says high quality. We live in an age where you can choose with confidence H.264 or H.265 high quality, and you know it's going to work almost everywhere. There was a time when this was a scarier thing. You didn't know if your client was going to be able to open it. You didn't know if YouTube was going to accept it. There was a lot more codecs, but now we live in a world where these two pretty much rule, and this is not as much of a problem it used to be. But I do want to give a shout out to what video compression is. And it's trying to make your video stream or your video as small as possible. And that's what Zoom's trying to do if it's in certain modes. It's trying to compress the heck out of your video to, to allow you to, to facilitate a meeting. It does not need to look as great as it should for a pitch video. So make sure you turn off those things or use a different tool where it's not compressing it. If you must use Zoom, be mindful of this and see if you can change those settings. I actually would just recommend that you don't. Uh, use a screen capture tool of another sort that probably is on your laptop by default. A lot of them even just come with them. Again, it depends on your specific OS version. And with that, I'm going to be done. I want to just, there's a slide here of these resources that I've called out, other editing tools that exist. Uh, you all have access to LinkedIn Learning, which can give you a crash course in how to use Premiere. You can be up and running on Premiere in 30 minutes or less if you use the LinkedIn Learning Essentials. Obviously, there's the intermediate and advanced class if you're really into it, but the 30-minute LinkedIn learning I can vouch for on Premiere Pro is a great way to get up and running with a tool that you can use in the CNU lab quickly with ignoring a lot of the things you don't need to know to get going and running. And with that, thank you. All right. Anybody on Zoom still? <laughs> thank you.